Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Bob Bennis. From the studios at the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest today is going to help us unbundle the myths and the rumors circulating about Catholics in divorce. But first, a hearty good morning to the host of Living Our Faith, Archbishop Jerome Listecki. Hi, good Bob. Morning. Hey, good. Uh, you talk about those myths. You talk about uh, those uh, those rumors. Uh, but I can tell you that as someone who has gone through the process of divorce and then annulment, um, I was one of those guys who thought, I am now excommunicated from the church, um, only to learn later on that I wasn't. Right. And, and there's a lot of misconceptions about um, uh, about Catholics, about the annulment process, right. about uh, divorce. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, Pope Francis is always so in, engaging in the family and marriage, because he himself is a uh, um, um, as Archbishop in Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. as, a, as a bishop, as a priest, encountered many many people um, um, who suddenly felt alienated or estranged from the church because of their marital situation. And our guest today comes to us from uh, the the tri- tribunal here. She's the tribunal chancellor. She's also a canon lawyer. And why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest? Sure. Uh, Sabrina Decker is the uh, administrator for our uh, tribunal. Wow. Pope Francis made some uh, extraordinary news, and he uh, he touched on and went into great detail with the annulment process. Uh, Sabrina, give us the backstory on this, if you would. Of course. Thanks, Bob. The uh, the Holy Father issued what we call a moto proprio, which means that it is it is something that's issued a letter, an apostolic letter that's issued under his own initiative. And what this moto proprio did was it adjusted some of the processes for declarations of nullity, which we uh, commonly call annulments. And it made uh, it it made some interesting changes. Uh, it made some things quicker, uh, an expedited process. It It also changed some of the rules for the ordinary process. So you have these two processes which still exist, and they'll be parallel processes. And um, I'd be happy to go over a couple of those things if you would like for your listeners. That'd be great. Terrific. Um, One of the things in the ordinary process, first I want to just let you know that that still exists. So the ordinary process that the tribunal has been working with for years still exists. And in both of these processes, let me be very clear, the law of the church is the same, um, and the stories that are brought to us by the people are the same. So the facts of the case will will be the same, that we are working with different couples and their own personal story. So in either of these processes, in both of them, we are looking at the law of the church. Nothing has changed in that in that way. For the ordinary process and the expedited process, what has changed is what we would call a rule of of, uh, competency. And what that means in common language is we need to be able to have the ability to work with a case that someone brings to us, that a petitioner brings to us. And that means that, that we have the jurisdiction, that the Archdiocese of Milwaukee can hear that case. And there are a number of ways that that, that has changed. And one is, uh, is that if the petitioner or the respondent lives in our Archdiocese, then we can hear the case. Now, before, if the respondent lived outside, we had to write to the tribunal where that person lived mm. to get consent to hear the case. Mm-hmm. So that's a big change. The other thing, too, is that if most of the evidence, if most of the witnesses are within the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, again, we don't have to go outside the Archdiocese to get that consent. So that's one of the big changes, I think, that's very important in the ordinary process. Also in the ordinary process, there used to be an automatic review after the Archdiocese, the court of first instance, gave a decision, came to a decision, then it was sent to another tribunal for us, the Tribunal of Green Bay, to be reviewed. And what this moto proprio has done, this has basically said that if neither party, the petitioner or the respondent, or the defender of the bond, who's one of the officials of the court, if they don't appeal, then we can close the case and it's considered complete. And that really is, I think, a wonderful uh, thing to be able to do because we take our ministry very seriously. And so to come to really moral certainty about a case is something that we do not do lightly. 
So this is one of those changes, I think, that is a benefit to the tribunal and to the people that can cut off a good maybe, you know, six to eight weeks from an ordinary case. So in the ordinary process, those are the two biggest changes. There is also an expedited process that the Holy Father is introducing and this process, again, will run parallel with the ordinary process, and it has a couple of, of strict interpretations that need to be observed. This is the process in which both parties, the petitioner and the respondent, need to uh, be on board, if you will, with the process itself. So the petitioner would file. The respondent needs to give consent. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't always necessarily happen in the mm -hmm. ordinary process, but in this expedited process, that must take place. The respondent must at least consent to the process. They may not necessarily like it, but they can at least say that, yes, they have no objection to the process itself. Right. Then, as I said, the, the details of the case must be evident, and we've been given some guidelines for that. So in this particular process, it would be something like um, the, the uh, circumstances surrounding a premarital pregnancy, circumstances surrounding evident uh, addiction, um, things of that sort. So th those... Uh, things must be manifest in the case. And if you have those two things, um, then you will be able to contact everyone and try and move the process along a little quicker. And in this process as well, if it is the expedited process, the archbishop himself is considered the judge in the case. So he can um, have us present the case. He can uh, have an instructor who is given to him and an assessor who is given to him to present the facts of the case. And then he would actually be the one who judges this expedited case. So even though people may say that uh, things maybe have gotten easier, that's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily about being easier. It's about observing those things that still need to be observed to protect the sanctity of marriage and the validity of marriage. And all of those things are still in place. So really, um, what's reported, what was reported in the news, that all annulments will be now a slam dunk in 45 mm -hmm. days, is just a misrepresentation. Absolutely a misrepresentation, right. And these particular things don't begin until December 8th. December 8th is the opening of the Year of Mercy, and that is when all of these new norms, new rules from this moto proprio will take place. So there are some cases that are in progress now that will, that will um, actually be judged under these new principles, but most of the cases uh, that will come to us will not have any of this be applicable until after December 8th. I know, Sabrina, we've talked about this um, uh, uh, before, about um, um, Americans feeling very comfortable with procedure mm -hmm. and establishing procedure and uh, being very uh, judicious in carrying out mm -hmm. basically their procedure uh, in this country. That's why, you know, the vast annulments um, in the world are are actually take place here in in the U United States. That's right. The procedures are in place. We follow the procedures and we do that. But that's not true for the rest of the world. Correct. And because it's not true for the rest of the world, po the Pope, being the shepherd of the Universal Church, mm -hmm. is attempting. To, um, to bring, let's say, everybody into some type of harmonious uh, approach towards uh, towards someone. So there isn't these inconsistencies that exist. Correct. No, I think I think you're absolutely right, Archbishop. Um, our tribunals here in the United States function very well, and we have uh, good canonists, who, and, and we have an abundance of canonists in most places, where in many tribunals within the world, there is a shortage of canon lawyers, and the process really it is not... Um, it just isn't a, a good process that people are able to enter into. Um, so the Holy Father is trying to bring all of these processes in line so that for the universal church, you have common processes. And that's really what we're doing here is is trying to be able to work with that. And I think I think it's a, a very good uh, process. I think it's a, a challenge for us, but I think it will really benefit the people of God. And a lot of people, in hearing what the Pope said, uh, read it to mean, interpreted it to mean, that this is good, cost does not matter. It's not going to include cost. It's going to be free, and as, as Archbishop said, it's going to be a slam dunk, and uh, to some extent, diminish the whole uh, the, the, the whole uh, sacrament of marriage, which you've clarified on. But what about cost? Can you 
touch on that, please? Sure. I think uh, here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, you know, cost Number one, let me be clear, cost is never a factor and Mm -hmm. never has been a factor here. The process for declaration of nullity has always been free. What we have always asked for is an administrative cost because it takes a lot to process one of these cases. It takes a lot of time. There may be an expert report, which we don't ask for payment from the petitioner for this expert report. We pay that cost. So these costs that we have uh, incurred, and that we ask for are not costs for the process itself, but they are administrative mm-hmm. costs. And I think it's, you know, we may have said this previously, uh, but I think it, it bears good to repeat it, that if people cannot pay, we do not ask for that. We can waive the fee. People can make small payments as they can, and we can even reduce the fee. But it, it is interesting that people do fail to realize that the cost of the administrative process mm-hmm. of the annulment, almost 50% of it is borne by the by the archdiocese itself. Yes, by the Catholic Stewardship Appeal. Yeah. Definitely. And definitely. So, very so, generous. So therefore, we, uh, you know, the support for that is already support for our, our Catholics who are basically um, engaged in that process. Yes. You know, um, many, um, uh, many tribunals have decided to totally waive the fee. The fee. Uh, before we we would announce that, we'd have to take a look to see um, what what manners and to discuss and in 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 what manner we're, we would be able to basically authentically subsidize that. Right. Um, there's a, there's another thing that I have is um, and uh, we've discussed this before when when you get something free, you don't usually appreciate the, basically. <laughs> right. Um, you know in. And if it's uh, if it's um, ever an aspect, Bob, where the the process is demeaned in any way by by that, well, then there there'd be a question of wh- whether or not there should be some contribution to mm-hmm. be able to demonstrate um, basically the genuine or authentic nature of the desire on the part of the person. Right. Right. And I I would agree. And I, I look forward to that conversation to see what can be done. Um, and we'll have to we will take a look at that in the future and um, and see what we might be able to decide on that. Do you expect any more, Zabrina, to come out uh, from the pope uh, with regard to annulments? Or do you think we've pretty much uh, heard what we're going to hear? Well, I think this is a, a good beginning. Um, mm-hmm. The Synod on the Family. Uh, it may produce more documentation, but I think as far as as process for declaration of nullity, I think we've got a lot to work with right now and a lot to digest. And uh, as I said, it will be a challenge, but I look forward to developing the new process that we need to put together. And I think that in the short amount of time that this has been out, you've definitely done your homework mm-hmm. because <laughs> you you unpacked that very, very well for us. And we thank you for that. Thank you. And we've also um, sent out FAQs to all of the priests and deacons and parish directors. There will also um, be more information as we unpack this. There will be more information that we will be able to uh, send out and have on the website. We want to talk about some of those myths and, and un- un- bundle those myths, but we need to take a break first. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. We'll be right back. Are you or a loved one struggling with age-related challenges? St. Camillus Geriatric Care Managers are here to partner with seniors and their families to help manage the many challenges and transitions associated with aging and health care. Jean explains how St. Camillus Geriatric Care Management assisted her father. People want to maintain their independence, and that's what he wanted. And that was the most important thing for him. However, at times he didn't know what was safest or best for him. And that's when we really leaned on care management. And they were able to help us so much. They were able to establish a trusting, caring relationship with my father. And we were able to trust and know that with their guidance, we would be able to keep my father safe in his own apartment. For more information regarding St. Camillus Geriatric Care Management, go to relevantradio.com keyword care. That's keyword care. Good morning. I'm Nisa Dalmas in the control room as we take this really quick break from living our faith. You know, we have so much information to share about the Pope's announcement on annulments that we don't even have time for the headlines. But remember, all the latest news can come right to you with your very own subscription to the Catholic Herald. That's where you'll find stories about phenomenal people like Jerry Nana Foch, who had a front row seat to see Pope Francis 
and even gave him one of her signature hugs. Read more about her chat with the Pope and her dream day come true at catholicherald.org. This is Nisa Dalmas in the control room as we go right back to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. Welcome back to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. We're talking with Sabrina Decker, one of the administrators at the tribunal. And I've gone through the experience, and I could I could give people what I thought were the myths, but I'm not the canon lawyer here in the room. So if you could for us, let's start to talk about these. And what are the misperceptions? What are the misunderstandings? that people have when it comes to divorce and annulment. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find when I visit parishes and give presentations at parishes is that you have um, a top three. I mean, I can make you a list of top 10, but I I think we'll stay away from that. But a top three really would be um, money, time, and children. And so you're looking at... uh, Concepts where people really have heard, unfortunately, through the Internet or Mm -hmm. through, you know, books or things of that sort, resources that are not very accurate, that it costs a lot of money. The Oprah Winfrey Show. The Oprah Winfrey Show. I was shouting at the television here listening to Oprah. She had someone on on the the television who claimed that the annulment. An annulment costs two thousand no, dollars. No, absolutely you know, I mean, not. Yeah, I, absolutely I, I not. Mean, and here is is a person who basically trusted by, mm-hmm. by oh, American, by by everyone. Thousands of people. So yeah. why you know why would Oprah lie? You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I don't think Oprah lied, but I don't think Oprah had any sense of of really what you know, the, the the process mm. has. No. To put it crudely, what does an annulment, an annulment cost? cost? Yeah, an annulment. Uh, basically, we ask for an offering, and here in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, it's five hundred and twenty-five dollars. Now, having said that, I use the word offering instead of cost, and I understand, Archbishop, you say that tongue in cheek because. You know as well. But um, we ask for an offering simply because of the time that is necessary and the process itself and how involved that process can be. I mean, sometimes in a a case you need to have an expert come in because we're not experts in psychology or cultural experts. We're canon lawyers. And so that can cost money. And we we don't pass that charge along to the people who petition for annulments. So, you know, it, it is $525, but it does not have to be paid all at one time. Small payments can be made. We have a sliding scale for service, just like Catholic Charities, and people can also petition to have that waived. And I think that's really very important. So the thing that I always want to stress is that no one should delay coming forth to the tribunal because of what they consider to be a cost that they can't afford, because we will work with them. One of the complaints is that this takes a long time. But in your experience, isn't there a good percentage of people that have already waited a long, if not long, long time to even come forward? Yes, yes. Everyone comes to this process in their own time. Right. And a lot of that is very emotional, and it has to do with relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, when when their marriage ended civilly, mm-hmm. There's a lot of reconstruction of life that has to happen. There's a lot of relationships that have to be rebuilt. And people don't necessarily think about the process in the church until they meet someone new. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful experience. And then all of a sudden they start coming around to, oh, yes, you know, I think I need to consider this. When they come to us, then they want to know how long is this going to take? How long is a decision going to take? Well, and, and that that's really, it depends on the case. Each case is, is examined on a case-by-case basis. This is not a cookie-cutter process. This is not a rubber stamp, and that's one of those other myths, that if you file and you wait long enough and you pay enough money, it just goes through. And that's that's not the case, you know. Relationships between two people are very complex, and our process examines that relationship between those two particular people, nobody else's. Mm-hmm. So it takes time. So in the, in the tribunal, we will say it will take approximately a year from the date when we meet with the petitioner to take their testimony, to hear their story. So that can be 14 months. It can be 16 months. But... That will be for a decision. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to automatically be an affirmative decision. 
but it will be a decision. Sometimes that time frame can be extended because sometimes there are uh, circumstances that are beyond our control with information that might come in from witnesses mm -hmm. in the case, information that might come in from the respondent in the case, or extra information from the petitioner. Or if we do need that expert that we talked about previously, right. sometimes that can take extra time as well. Part of the, uh, the process, too, is since it's non-adversarial, mm -hmm. it, it can be a way to, of self-examination. Yes, uh, so that when someone goes through the uh, annulment process, mm -hmm. they are looking at uh, the factors that um, may have contributed to the fact of why the, uh, the there was a breakup in the marriage, mm -hmm. right? why the uh, people were not disposed to do what the church uh, asked them to do. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it becomes almost like a little bit of a corrective. So they they don't, if you... If, to use the expression, marry the same mistake, right? So that they become involved in the same in the same situation, the same pattern, or address those problems mm -hmm. that are there. You're right, Archbishop. Very much so. And in fact, we like to look at this as a ministry, as a healing ministry in the church, because then what happens is that self reflection that you referred to can lead to greater success in a subsequent marriage versus maybe not taking a look at what happened in that previous marriage, now the person has had that ability to reflect. They've walked with us through this process, and the healing at the end of the process really can make for a much more successful marriage. Let's talk about the children. Mm -hmm. uh, common, common thought is that the children we had are not legitimate because of this. Yes. Yes, I have heard that previously. And one thing that I really want to say is that this process is... A, a reflection is an examination of the relationship between two people, those who were involved, the petitioner and the respondent, the groom and the bride, the husband and wife. Okay, so that is all we look at, that is all we examine, and that is what we make a decision upon. Not children. Mm -hmm. uh, the process has nothing to do with children. It makes no comment about children. It makes no judgment on children. There is no decision on children. It is only the relationship between the parties themselves. And in fact, we are very clear because some, some will ask us, can my children actually be witnesses for me? Can, can they give a statement? And we say no. We, we don't want that to happen. Now, if they're adult children and they come to that on their own, that's theirs. But for children who are involved in the process, we want to be very clear that we protect them in this process and that we make no judgment on them. But the aspect of um, I, I can't get uh, an annulment because if I get an annulment, it means that my first marriage was not valid mm -hmm. and work, so therefore my children are yeah. illegitimate. Yeah, we make no judgment on that because legitimacy and illegitimacy are civil concepts. And they're not they're not ecclesiastical concepts. They're 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 not what we would work with in the church. So they were married civilly, they are civilly divorced, and the children that were conceived within that marriage are legitimate. Legitimate. Yes, and it's uh, that helps um, uh, immediately put to rest the sensitive, hurtful mm -hmm. situations mm -hmm. that some people experience, and I, and I, and I'm I've been divorced civilly. Um, can I still come to mass and receive the Eucharist? Yes, because I think that's a, that's another one. I, I look at look at what I've done. Now I can't go to church anymore. Mm -hmm. Look at what I've done. Now I can't go to communion anymore. Look what's happened, and now I can't go to church. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was and 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 that was that's also a misconception mm -hmm. that. Um, that divorce in and of itself suddenly um, um, restricts somebody from uh, uh, approaching the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. When it's not divorce, but the remarriage after a divorce that suddenly becomes um, 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 becomes restrictive for somebody to go to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. and, and another question that comes up is, will my former spouse, and I think this is in your frequently asked questions on, right. on, on the Archmill website, will my former spouse have to participate in this declaration of annulment, the invalidity process. Right. Uh, the former spouse, I like the way you put that, will they have to participate? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, 
They do not have to participate. What canon law envisions is that the former spouse be contacted and be notified that this process has begun or that the petitioner, the person who is asking, is asking for this process. The respondent can be in, involved as much as they would like. They can uh, tell us that, that they don't want to be involved. They just want to know the outcome. They can tell us uh, that they would like to be involved, and, and we are more than happy to speak to anyone. In fact, we welcome that because the more information we have about the relationship, the more accurate our decision can be. And that's extremely important in the process, uh, in, in this annulment process. We interview, personally interview every petitioner who asks for the process and we will personally interview every respondent if they wish to be part of the process i wish everyone would but must they be involved no they do not have to be involved in the process and one thing that i would like to follow up on just with that very briefly is people may be uh, out there saying well i don't even know where the respondent is i i don't know if i can even locate them mm -hmm. will that you know, hold this up. Should I even file? Because you're saying that you want to talk to them. You're saying that canon law says that they should be contacted. Yes, but canon law also doesn't hold someone to the impossible. Mm -hmm. So if a marriage ended many years ago and there were no children and the parties have lost track of each other, we can try and track a respondent down through the internet. It's an amazing thing these days, as you know. Uh, and sometimes we can find them and we will offer them the ability to participate. If we cannot find them, that does not inhibit the case going forward. What happens is canon law expects us to search for them. We will do that. And if we can prove that we have done that, but we still can't find them, the case can move forward. The process can move forward. So it still is something that, that can happen. We just need to be able to show that we have made a good faith effort. And we do that. We do that in every case. If someone were listening to us right now who was a, a divorced mm -hmm. uh, Catholic, and wish to um, um, wish to start the process mm -hmm. of an annulment. What would they do? There are a number of things they can do. They can approach their pastor at their parish, and they would have the paperwork that that is necessary to begin. They can go right on our website archmill.org and there's not only the paperwork that's there in English and in Spanish, but also a booklet called Declaring a Marriage Null, and it explains the entire process and all of the people that are involved in the process. Or, and this is, I think, a great idea too, just call us. You can call the general number for the Archdiocese and ask for the tribunal, and I can assure you that no matter who you get, you, they will have the information that you need. Be happy to send a form out, be happy to listen to any sort of background you want to give us, and we'll get that process started for you. We're willing to walk with you and, and really help you in any way we can. We will also so uh, have a, a link to this information on both the uh, Archmill website as well as the Facebook page. We're going to take a break now. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio. Hospice. It's the one word that people are afraid to say out loud. Yet for someone who has experienced St. Camilla's Hospice, it takes on a whole new meaning. We chose St. Camilla's Hospice because it was home hospice. I think it would have broken Lois's heart if she had to leave and go to a strange place. And one of the things that we particularly appreciated was the Catholic help that we got when Lois was in hospice. We had pastoral help. We had chaplains who were absolutely fantastic. They were all so friendly. The hospice care was as good for Lois as it was for me. Hospice care is a physical and spiritual journey, not just for the patient, but for an entire family. St. Camilla's Hospice provides compassionate care right in your loved one's own home. All caregivers and resources are thoughtfully selected from the St. Camilla's community, which continues to serve your family long after the physical care has ended. To learn more, go to relevantradio.com, keyword hospice. We'd like to thank our guest today, Sabrina Decker, for helping us to unbundle a lot of the myths and misunderstandings of the annulment process. Sabrina, thank you very much. And thank you. It is time for us to close. And may the blessings of Almighty God be upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We thank everyone for tuning us in here on Relevant Radio. I'm Bob Bennis. Have a wonderful weekend, and we remind you to see with God's eyes. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.